Greetings, everybody, to the first session of the CGS WWT World Federalist Book Club. Yay! <laughs> and our first book that we're going to be discussing is Planethood by Ben Ferenz, our good friend who um, is 98 years old, and we hoped he'd be able to join us for this, but unfortunately he won't be but um he is the author of the book which is in two versions one is this version this is the first version oh. and this is the second one and they are the same except the second one has some additional introductory remarks by ken kesey who um was a well-known author, and um, he was the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and I think that Ben recruited him to try to get more attention for the book. Um, anyway, um, why don't we go around and see who's here and maybe give your general comments about the book to start with. To start left to right, or? Okay, I don't see a left to right, um, you know, yeah, I don't like this one. <laughs> on top like I usually would in, in, on Zoom. I okay. see you, Melanie, taking up the whole screen. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Gail, you have to switch. You can switch to gallery view on your computer. Oh, in the upper, okay. In the upper right, where if you hover, it's over. Do you see it now? It's, it's a toggle between speaker view and gallery view. So uh, upper right, just, just up a right at the black box, there yeah. is a um, gallery view. Oh, actually, maybe what it, it might look like oh. a matrix of dots. If you see dots. something that looks oh. like a matrix of dots, do you see that? Gallery view. She right. said it's upper right, but I didn't see an upper right. For us, it's upper it. right. Upper right of your black box. Or for me, it's a black box that shows. But Is never mind. Right? Go ahead. Just want me to call out the names in an order I can see since you're having trouble. Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. Bob Hurd. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I've been looking forward to hearing more about this book since Donna mentions it each semester as she comes to talk to my healthcare ethics course along with Ben Ernston. Thanks, Bob. Uh, ben Ernston. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm. Uh, I can't uh, get my camera so that uh, I'm uh, part of the picture, but uh, I'm a veteran of World War II, and uh, I've been uh, a Jesuit uh, after the war was over. So I'm a Jesuit priest. And I've uh, just uh, come to a retirement home, and uh, therefore I'm I'm not as familiar with uh, the computer here. So, oh, but Jerry, before we the poll, there be. I, oh. I, uh, I have I made a, a video at Xavier University. Terribly. Played in okay. Cincinnati last night. We're having a little trouble hearing you, Ben. You're a little muffled, but we're going to move on. Lee Davis. I'm a longtime fan of Planet Hood book from Maine. <laughs> uh, Melanie Bennett. Hello everyone, I'm here in, near San Diego in El Cajon, California, and I'm with the film The World is My Country, and I've read the first chapter, so I'm excited to talk about it. Thanks for joining us, Melanie, it's good to see you. Tom Hastings. Uh, hi, I'm somewhat, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we only see your forehead though. <laughs> That's, I, unfortunately, <laughs> Zoom is not, is crashed or something. Oh, but I guess you can hear me, so I can talk. <laughs> um, we see you. We see you, and we hear you. 
You can just barely hear me? No, we hear you and see you. Oh, you can. Okay. <laughs> I can't see me on, on our screen. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've been a CGS member since about 2007 out here in California. Okay, Ron Glossop. Ron, we're introducing ourselves. Tom Hastings is going right now. Uh, okay, I'm I'm sorry to be late. I just got too many things going on, and including trying to reread Planet Hood again. <laughs> Oops, that was. Oh, I'm I'm uh, very interested. And very glad to have read Planet Hood for this me for this meeting, and it uh, the the main point of it is that we. We, the people, have to take uh, control and push this idea. It's not going to come from our leaders. Mm. So we yeah. Need to out how to do uh, I agree with that. It is a really great book, and I think it is one of the most important books for people to be directed toward about exactly how to analyze the problems confronting the world today. It was written in 1988, and things were going very well at that time compared with where we are now. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ron. Evan Freund. Good morning. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry to be late. Yeah, it was a pleasure to read the book. Look forward to the discussion. Uh, M. Groff, uh, you have your... Um, yeah, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a... I just got off a plane, so <laughs> I'd rather not make an appearance uh, visually. What's your, what's your first uh, name? Maya. My name is Maya. Maya. I'm, yeah, I'm in The Hague. I'm an international lawyer. I'm working on global governance reform issues, and I've, I've met Ben Ferenz and seen him talk, and also his son, and I really love his, his vision. I did not have time. It's hard to get... English books in the Netherlands sometimes I still have to order the book so I'm going to listen to all of what you have to say and to report on the book but just to let you know I just returned from a meeting in Washington DC uh, where there were UN Secretariat officials and others preparing for the UN 75 um, commemoration and that was exactly that message that was just shared that reform really has to come from the people mm -hmm. Thank you. Dave Otten. Uh, I'm Dave Otten. I teach world religions at St. Louis University and uh, a member of the uh, national board in the St. Louis chapter. Um, I uh, think that planethood is a, a great primer that we need to uh, constantly hand out at our different uh, in venues for people who have never heard of the idea of World Federation to uh, get introduced to it. And this past Monday, I was able to introduce uh, the new documentary film about Ben Friends at the St. Louis Jewish Film Festival. And we had a whole theater full of people who watched this new documentary. And I hope that uh, because of the discussion in this book club, I hope everybody gets a chance to see this new film. It's very well done. It talks about Ben's work at Nuremberg and also in uh, promoting the ICC. And uh, hopefully we might even be able to see, uh, see that new film called Prosecuting Evil, The Extraordinary World of Ben Friends, um, maybe through uh, our national meeting in uh, Los Angeles. And after the film, uh, Ron Glossop and I were able to hand out about 40 different copies to uh, interested people. We just gave them out for free. And so there are at least 40 people in St. Louis who are now reading uh, the book, Planet Hood. Right. That's awesome. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Jean. Jean, I see you. Hi. Hi. Oh, yes, hi. Um, well, I'm just truly interested in this. I don't have any connection to any organizations or anything. Um, but I, and I haven't finished reading the book yet, but I'm really enjoying it. And I keep thinking, okay, who can I share this book with? This is a wonderful book. And, but then on the other hand, um, I'm thinking, well, we have global warming happening. I don't know how this is going to help us in that respect. So, and, and my background is as an artist. 
Oh, great. Well, thank you yeah. for joining us, Jean. Mm -hmm. Larry David, I see you've joined. We're just introducing yep. ourselves and saying what we thought of the book. Well, I'm Larry David. I'm in Blackhawk, South Dakota. I'm a, a businessman. I've uh, been a volunteer with the World Federalists and uh, Citizens for Global Solutions for many years. And, uh, Planet, Planet, I, I became familiar with Planet Herd back in the, in the uh, early 80s and um, have uh, periodically returned to it and, and uh, find it to be a, a, very, uh, a very good little uh, primer on, on uh, world government and, and uh, it comes from a, it comes from a place of human rights above the, above the uh, level of, of as a first, as a first uh, value. Good morning which is where we need to be. And I'm um, looking forward to the discussion here. Thank you. Uh, who is with area code 414 on the phone? Is there someone on the phone with an area code of 414? Well, I, I think that's me again. I'm, I'm on, uh, I can see you on my computer, but um, I'm on my cell phone. So I'm on twice. And Jean, are you Jean? Is that Jean talking? I am Jean, yes. And I did okay. want to just want say one other thing. I am connected with Christian Life Community. So, and through Father Ben Urmson and Donna Parks. Yeah, great. Uh, who's area code 818? Uh, Gregory Wright, uh, at the invite of Tab Daly. Oh, Gregory Wright. Well, thank you for joining us. We're introducing ourselves and saying a little bit about whatever we want to say about the book to just get us started. Do you, would you like to say anything? Uh, <laughs> um, I've only read a very small part of it, so I don't have a basis to say a lot, but I'm very interested in internationalism and saving the world and saving the planet and looking forward to uh, being enlightened further in the discussion. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, who's area code 323? That would, in fact, be me, Tad Daly. Hello. Oh. Hi, dear Tad. Welcome. Hi there. I, um, uh, I, I, I just wanted to say, uh, we're supposed to say something about the book. Well, I wanted to say that, uh, in fact, I did invite Gregory Wright, who uh, uh, coincidentally spoke just before me. And the reason I did is that if you all turn to page XV, I guess that's Roman numeral uh, 15, uh, in the Ferenc Keys book, Planethood, you will see that Ferenc and Keys quote a wonderful article called Our New Millennium's Resolution by Peter Sorensen and Gregory Wright. Ah. So Greg Wright is an old friend and colleague of mine, and he is in fact quoted in this book uh, way back in 1991, uh, very presciently looking at uh, environmental and uh, war and peace challenges, uh, as presciently as, uh, presciently as Ken Keys and Ben Friends did as well. So, Thank you, small part that I read. Um, Arthur Kanegas, I see you've joined us. Would you like to introduce yourself and say a little, something about the book quickly? You're on mute. We can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. It's such a wonderful book club. Uh, yes, I'm Arthur Kanegas, the director of the film "The World Is My The World Is My Country," <laughs> and uh, we uh, uh, we're just very excited that the Twin Cities Public TV is going to be broadcasting it in the fall. Uh, and uh, I was we're also very excited this week because we're all involved in uh, getting that doing that big showing of the film on uh, the 12th. It's all across the country. It's, it's all over Minneapolis and all over the world. Uh, it's called Free Trip to Egypt. It, it really helps toward world citizenship and planethood in the sense that it's breaking down uh, the stereotypes and borders. Yeah, he, he went to Trump rallies and so on and offered a free, free trip to uh, Egypt, brought anti-Muslims and people who thought Muslims are going to behead them and cut off their heads and got them convinced enough to go on a free trip to Egypt and, 
and to fall in love with the families there. So uh, you all should definitely look that up because it's going to be at theaters on Monday, June 12th, in all over the country, wherever you are, there are theaters that have it. So look it up on free trip to Egypt. Uh, and uh, with the book, what's so credible about the book is it's just such plain common sense, uh, logical, simple, uh, not, you know, too involved. In, and, and, and it basically just shows how, uh, uh, how we can, can be a law force to the law, to the, to the force of law, that, uh, that law has power and that this, there is, that we can handle, so we can, uh, we can come to, uh, uh, come to fruition from our, 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 our separatehood and, and childhood and the, uh, curing it the planethood. Um, okay, thank you. So I'm Donna Park. I am currently board chair of, of Citizens for Global Solutions. And I just am so excited to reread this book, which was one of the two books that got me uh, interested in World Federation, thanks to Ben Ermston for, and my Christian life community who did the reading together. Um, the two things I want to say quickly is one is that sort of maybe Jean alluded to it, but I feel like um, it's good to talk about expanding the ultimate human right that is in here because it doesn't mention the environmental crisis that we're facing. So I feel like maybe it would be helpful to update that as if we talk about the book to others because, it, because the solutions solve that problem, that he talks about solve that problem as well. And the other thing I want to say is I, I smiled when I read the chapter about do something every day because I remember it was this book and Father Ben Ermston that got me working every day in order to the <laughs> World Federation. And I guess I want to thank them both or not. <laughs> anyway, uh, Gail, I think that's up to you. We've heard from everybody but you, Gail. Oh, well, I was so impressed by Ben Ferenz when we had him on the phone to give him his award at the national meeting. So, um, that adds, I think, to my appreciation of the book. And I'm sorry he hasn't been able to join us, but I think, I, I think he wrote it for, my guess is, as an introductory, easy to read, short pitch for the need for World Federation. And I think it does a good job in that regard. And we can maybe think about can we, I don't know if we can get sort of unlimited copies of this, but um, as people are interested, you know, new people are interested in what we have to say, if we could maybe, you know, point them in the direction of this book, that may help to con convey what, um, what we're about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I, I I think CGS does have many copies. I'll have to go check our um, inventory, but I know like Ron asked us to ship a box to him, which we did, and there might be, we might have more boxes, um, but uh -huh. I'll have to go check our, our, uh, check our list, our inventory. And I guess it still is available through Amazon. So after all these years, that's, um, there is a PDF that's good to know. That's it's available. I don't know that we can use, any, use that in any way, but. Say that again, Tom. I didn't hear a, you. There's a PDF of the book um, on Ben's website. <laughs> um, so I'm sure he, if we want to use it in any way, we he would be happy to <laughs> have us do it. I, okay. Uh, Great, thank you. A PDF, so in other words, People could bring it up for free and read it for free on their computer? That's right. And oh, wow. Well, that, that would be a great resource. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, could that information about how exactly how to get to that website be distributed by email to everyone so that people have a written record of it that they can keep for not only now, but for the future? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that after. The Thank time. you. 
that would be very helpful. Um, you know that Ben wants to um, you know, distribute it. You, there's no copyright concern or anything like that. So, um, you know, uh, Evan here, what, uh, why don't we put a link on our website to, yes. to get it? Yes, I will. I made a note already. I, I will see that that happens. Good. Well, let's move on to the next question. The kind of a the first specific question, namely, um, I say that of the eight steps, there were um, eight steps that were described in the in the book. And it seemed to me that step two and, and step five seem related, in that both of those discuss the structure of an effective world federation. It embodies the essentials of a world constitution on page 48 and how the present UN needs to be reformed on page 106. And I ask, how do the organizational components discussed by Ferenz compare with those proposed by Joe Schwartzberg in his Transforming the UN System Designs for a Workable World? Now, most of us have read Joe's book, so I thought it would be um, useful to compare and contrast. I think it's important to remember that Schwarzberg is writing at a much later period when a lot of things have already transpired since 1988. And I think it's also important that we recognize that the number of countries in the UN is now up to 193. So if we're talking about World Federation, I think it's much more important to think in terms of the kind of thing that Schwarzberg is proposing that suggests that maybe what we need to do is um, collectivize the countries in the Security Council so that we have, instead of 193 separate sovereign nation states, uh, we could maybe get down to like 10 continental federations. And he, he already has it divided up in the, uh, what are very logical ways of putting together countries that have common traditions. Hmm. You've got one cluster in Europe called, right now, the European Union. And it's well, but we also have the African Union, and we also have the African of so the Union of South American countries. So we already have three continental federations underway. That would make a good infographic. Ron, I, I just want to be precise. And I, I very much applaud the sentiment that you are advancing. But as you know better than I think almost anyone on this call, none of those three could yet accurately be called federations. Yes, In Europe, that's right. there is somebody of, of opinion that says it ought to become a federation. And we very much uh, are behind that body of opinion. And that's people like the Young European Federalists and the Union of European Federalists, who we know and work with and collaborate with. But that is a goal still yet to be achieved. Yes, that's an important point. They use the term union, but that is an ideal that they're pursuing rather than something they have already realized. Donna Stack. <clears throat> hey, Donna? To address your question, Gail, about comparing and contrasting the two books, like in my copy, which is this old one, up on a page, uh, page 106, there are there his 14 points for reforming the UN, uh, for instance. and many of them are similar to the points that um, that Joe touches on. However, Joe's book, as Ron said, is much more recent and is also much more detailed. Yes. So to me. The, the beauty of Ben's book is that he, you don't get bogged down in all the details, but you have a sense that there is a better way to run the world. And even if I don't understand every little detail, I get it. You know, that's what happened to me. I read this. I got it. It's like, oh, my gosh, why aren't we trying to do this? 
Um, whereas for me, I think Joe's book is much more detailed and, and perhaps you know, I mean, more of a roadmap to really do it. But this is more helpful for winning hearts and minds of people, I think. I don't know if that's making sense, but I don't know. Oh, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. That, that's a very good distinction. Yeah, thanks. They're not quite the same. And of course, uh, the Ben's doesn't have uh, environmental stuff in it the way uh, Joe's does. Right. So. It, it focuses I, on the overall goal and not on the details. Mm -hmm. But it does have some things about the environment in planet Earth. Can you, I'm here having trouble hearing you, whoever that is. That's Ben Erbston. Oh, yeah, you're, you, can you get closer to your microphone? There, there is something about the environment in uh, planet Earth. Uh, if you look at the index, <laughs> it'll lead you to uh, uh, a, a kind of summary of why we need uh, democratic uh, world authority. That is, the environment is uh, uh, interdependent. All, all the nations have to be interested in the environment. Yes, everybody knows that. You're saying it's included in planethood? Well, somewhat. Tad Stack. It is mentioned. Go ahead, Tad Stack. Go ahead, did you well, thank you, Father Ben, for uh, making that point, and I, and I want to. I happen to have it right in front of me, and it, it, frankly, it, it's one of the things that uh, I think, I used the word prescient earlier when I was talking about Greg Wright's contribution, and I will use it again here. It is on, uh, on, on my version, uh, page, page two and page three, and it's a real macro thesis that uh, Keys and Ferenz advance, where they say they are, there are two great perils that the human race faces, uh, two great dangers of bringing about our own demise, and it's a very clever way of putting it. One is the fast way, as he puts it, of, as they put it, of nuclear war, and the other is, and I'll, I'll read now, the slow way through the deterioration of our oceans, lands, and atmosphere, and our heedless destruction of the environment. Trashing of the planet can result in an uninhabitable world for our children. So two, two points, and then I will shut up. One, one is, I, I think that's a very important sort of, uh, a very creative way to put it. There, there is a fast way to bring about our own demise, the nuclear way, uh, and I think most of you know that that's uh, some of my professional background is uh, focusing on nuclear disarmament. Uh, climate change and other environmental perils can have every bit as much, can pose every bit as much of a threat to the human race, but of course it would come about gradually rather than in, in, in an afternoon. And then, friends and keys say, is the great, the great insight is that we have a single solution that can enable us to solve both of these great challenges to the human race, and that is World Federation. Page two and three, the two great yeah. perils we face. Ted, let me mention, your pagina, pagination, pages two and three, is for the 1991 trade paperback edition, which has a red cover with a blue border. Right. Most of us have in front of us the first edition of 1988, which has a blue cover. And that is not okay. it. Well, and the paginations are not the same. And that material you just read us, Tad, thank you for reading it, but it's not in the book I read. Right. Oh, goodness. It, okay. But it is oh. in the 1991 edition. I've got both of them. <laughs> and, oh, and what Tad just read is on pages two and three of the 1991 edition. Yeah, otherwise, the, um, you know, it's easier to if we're talking about material in different steps, if we know what step it is, we can usually track something down. 
but the page numbers are a bit different. I'm looking at the 14 point program for reforming the UN, which is on page 106 in the blue small original book and 102 in the um, updated book with the red and blue cover. And here, those are the proposals that Ferenz has to improve, one, improve the General Assembly decision-making process. So he says it needs to be improved, but Joe gives the specifics about how to improve that by um, having the weighted voting system. So I'm thinking the comparison there is the general point that Ferenz makes versus the specifics that, um, that Joe has. Then two, modify the veto in the Security Council. Again, Ferenz makes the general, um, presents the general idea that it needs to be revised, but Joe Schwartzberg gives a specific proposal for how it should be modified. Three, create an international disarmament organization. Um, you know, again, the, these are just general things in terms of the need for reform of these various aspects of the UN. And Joe gives specific proposals for each of these, as I see. Yes, agreed. Agreed that, that Ben's book is more inspirational and, up, and not the details. You need both books, I think. Is there anything in this list that Joe does not address? I'm just trying to think out of curiosity. Well, I think the big thing that is different is so much history in the Ferenc book. That is one of its valuable points. It gives you the historical background of what's been going on in the way of progress toward an international realm or a global realm. But, um, you know, it is that historical part that you get in Ferenc that Joe just assumes, oh, you, you guys should know about this. <laughs> right. Well, that kind of leads us to the second specific question. This C on the question sheet, steps three and four also seem related in that they pertain to implementation. How doable is the Ferenc agenda, do you think? He compares where we're at now with the history of the U.S. changing from a confederation to a federation. Do you agree? So he gets into that history in, in that way. And I personally found it also the most interesting part of the book. And actually, from my perspective, the most inspirational, because it's so easy to know, you know, we're hit every day about the limitations and the problems and man, it just seems difficult to uh, achieve. But when he talks about this history, it makes me think, well, maybe we can actually do this. Um, Evan Stack. Evan? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the great strengths of this book is that it brings it down to an individual's uh, level. In other words, uh, there's any number of initiatives that people can take to build world community. And he, within uh, an international legal structure too, by the way. So this uh, is a, a wonderful um, um, inspiration uh, for people to get involved however they can and wherever they can in building world community. I think that the uh, book is encouraging <laughs> uh, uh, can you speak up, please? That's Ben. Ben, can you get closer to your microphone? Or? I, I think the book is encouraging. Uh, and um, I, I think it's uh, good to have quotations from people that you might not uh, expect to support it, like Bush and... Um, Reagan and Gorbachev. Gorbachev uh, from the Soviet Union uh, uh, favored uh, world over. 
Yeah, and Einstein on page 118 of a 1988 version, there's a quote on page 118 from Einstein. But there are wonderful quotes throughout the book. I think as one of the main other advantages of the Planet Hood book is all these quotations from these different people giving you background information. And Debbie compiled them. Did I send that to you? I thought I Yes, had... you did. And I think that was a great contribution that Debbie Metke made, that she has put all of these quotations together in one place. Dave Auden. By the way, just backtracking a moment um, to the 14-point program, I noticed that Forens does include attention to the environment under number 10 create stronger UN environmental and conservation programs. So he does acknowledge that. And of course he doesn't go into detail on that, but he doesn't go into detail on any. any right. 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 I was trying to get in Gail, I think. Oh, sorry. Sorry, who? Dave. Dave Vaughn. Oh, Dave, go ahead. Yeah. For those of you who uh, joined the call late, I want to mention again uh, the new documentary film called Prosecuting Evil, The Extraordinary World of Ben Friends that just came out. It was made this past February and uh, was recently shown in St. Louis. That film uh, emphasizes Ben's background at Nuremberg and then in promoting the International Criminal Court. And so we have to realize that the books we have in front of us were long before the establishment of the International Criminal Court that Ben mentions in number eight of this 14 point program. But in uh, the film, it goes into great detail uh, in the last part of how Ben was one of the moving forces for the creation of the International Criminal Court. Uh, here in the book, it says, number eight, create an international criminal court to try hijackers and terrorists. Well, we know that once the international criminal court was created, that it is a permanent court uh, or and a last resort to try people involved in uh, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And so um, that's why I think the new film the new documentary film that just came out is a great supplement to the book that we're reading now, and I hope everybody gets to, a chance to see that film. I saw the film too, and I agree agree with Dave completely that that film, Prosecuting Evil, is a very worthwhile book, uh, film, and it is a video that really is the life of Ben Ferenz and why he has gone from where he was in the military to being a big promoter of world law. There's, uh, there's two films together, which might be worth doing in a series. There's one called The Prosecutor uh, that's also excellent along the same lines and The Prosecuting Evil uh, might be worth, uh, uh, worth doing those in a, a Double feature, or or, or or get a screening going in Minnesota or wherever we're uh, uh, able to. Uh, and it looks like it's on Netflix. Okay. Prosecuting Eve, also. Yeah. Oh, it's on Dad. Netflix. Mm -hmm. Looks like it. Dad, back. Dad. Since we're uh, talking about Ben Ferenz's biography, I just want. To mention something that I just learned. Um, I, you, like, like so many of us, I, I read this terrific book years ago and then looked through it again for the book club today. Um, and most of us know about Ben's uh, remarkable role at Nuremberg and then that he became a lifetime advocate of uh, our vision and in fact played this huge role in the creation of the uh, International Criminal Court. But I discovered two days ago with my rereading of Planet Hood something I don't think I ever knew before. He was a, he, he was a soldier at D-Day. Uh, th Thursday, of course, was the 75th anniversary of uh, D-Day, uh, a, pr a pretty major event in world history by any reckoning. And here's the sentence. Uh, in my version, it's on XXXIII, quote, I plunged into the sea 
at Omaha Beach on uh, Normandy and was baptized by the tide of a world at war. And then as an enlisted man under General Patton, I fought in every campaign in Europe. I just wanted to point that out. I had no idea that Ben Ferenz actually hit the beach on June 6, 1944. And it, is, uh, it, it gives even more credibility to his remarkable vision of how to prevent such warfare from ever taking place again. What do others think about, um, do we agree, do you agree with Ben that we're at a place at present similar to when the U.S. was changing from a confederacy to a federation? Well, Ron has a view that there, there is a great deal of similarity. And in fact, the, the reference uh, to, to the book about the, <clears throat> the great rehearsal by Van Doren, which runs through how difficult it was to create the United States of America. It was not an easy task. The Federalists were opposed by the Anti-Federalists. And they only barely succeeded, largely in my view, due to Alexander Hamilton making a couple of important moves, including leading the convention in New York, which ratified the U.S. Constitution by three votes. If two people had voted the other way, New York would not have ratified. If New York had not ratified, New England would have been separated from all the other colonies. It was not an easy task. So reading that book, The Great Rehearsal by Van Doren, does give you a view to how difficult the creation of the United States of America was. It was not an easy job. Donna Stack. Donna? Um, I, I, I agree. I find it really helpful in talking to other people who don't know anything about this to refer to what happened in the U.S., how everybody knows we were a confederation of states. They don't really necessarily understand that the states had militia to fight each other. And so I, I, whenever I'm, well, talking to Father Bob's class or just to my friends or family members, whoever I'm talking to, I always bring that up and say that, you know, it's time now, the world has shrunk enough that we need to do at the global level what the U.S. did at the national level back in, in the late 1700s. And so I, I think it's people, and most people kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, that makes sense. I mean, I think it's, I think it's very helpful to explain and especially mention the fact that the states no longer spend any money funding, funding their militia to protect each other. Instead, they go to the court, court of law. Very good point, yes. Other comments about that? Yeah, Gail, Tad Daly, I, I would like to say something about Tad? Go ahead. Tad, we can't hear you. Are you talking? Hmm. I don't hear either. That would be too difficult. No, me either. We lost him. Oh, Tad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You I got Can I keep talking? We hear you now. Yeah. I thought, so, yeah, not, not sure what happened there. Donna made that excellent point that uh, Illinois and Wisconsin do not spend a dime to defend themselves against each other. And that is a, it, it's an analogy that we want to present for the world stage. Our vision is that someday China and America, the two great superpowers of, uh, of the coming decades, will someday have a relationship that's much like the relationship between Illinois and Wisconsin. So my, my first point is that I think that's a very brilliant point for us to, uh, to make. Thank you for making it, Donna. But, but now I wanna advance a quick uh, cautionary uh, note, which is I, I think we have to be careful not to overdo it with the American analogy, because our system of government has a lot of problems today. We don't want something like the U.S. Senate, which profoundly overrepresents uh, 
uh, these tiny states on the world level. We don't want something like the Electoral College uh, on the world level, you know, which is this profoundly undemocratic thing that, uh, that so distorts our presidential election. I guess I just, when we're talking about the American example, I think we as Americans ought to express a little humility and say that, yes, Federation, like what happened on the eastern seaboard of North America in the late uh, 18th century, is the goal for the world community. But we're going to need input from the whole world. And we hardly, I think we ought to say, we hardly propose that the American model ought to be just replicated uh, exactly on the world level. Uh, right. Let's show the humility to say that we want the whole world experience with uh, intelligence and sagacious mechanisms of governance to be brought to this conversation. Thank you. Ron, uh, Tad, I agree with you 100%, but if we're addressing Americans, it does seem like people in the United States that this is a very good place to begin. <laughs> it is a good place to begin. Maybe uh, <clears throat> this would be a funny way of going about it, but this is just a movie idea. Uh, we wake up to find that North Dakota is threatening a first strike on South Dakota. And South Dakota is threatening a, a retaliation in kind. And they both have uh, nuclear bunkers <laughs> under the ground. But of course, that was so totally absurd. Uh, you, so you make the point by painting uh, the absurdity of nations threatening to destroy each other by showing how absurd it would be for North and South Dakota to make that those threats. And then Montana and Wyoming, they've got nukes too. If they join in and it's absurd, but it maybe makes the point in a funny way. Uh, this is Gail. I was thinking a lot about the difference between the states in the U.S. and the countries in the world. You know, is it um, comparable? And apparently it's not at this particular time. Um, I think it will be at some point. But the, there were states that, you know, some of them were bigger than others. Some of them were more powerful than others. But none of them, I mean, there were, I guess there were some threats of fighting between states earlier on. There were wars between there them. There were wars. And don't, and don't forget the slave states versus the free states as being an incredible challenge and problem. There were a group of colonists that went from Connecticut into New York and they were killed. There was a massacre. They killed 10,000 people. So wow. I don't know whether you want to call that a war or not, but it certainly was a serious conflict. The, the biggest problem I see in the world today is that the, the biggest, most powerful countries, and the U.S. being a prime example, launch wars of aggression against other states. It isn't misunderstandings or disputes over water or something. It's that the powerful countries just go and try to destroy other countries for their resources, it seems. And I don't know if that was the case in the U.S. before. Uh, it was to well, some extent. It was to some extent between Virginia and Pennsylvania. But, you know, there was uh, compl were people in Virginia complaining that all the territory that became the Eastern United States really belonged to Virginia. But was Virginia um, threatening to launch wars of aggression against other states in order to... No, because of the leadership in Virginia. That was a critical difference. Uh, and, uh -huh. and we had some leadership like that in the United States under Obama. I mean, the situation changes depends, depending on who the leaders are. Gorbachev was a world federalist. He had studied Western law. He knew about this history that, that Ferenz points out. So it was not an accident that Gorbachev led the movement that he led. But then after 1991, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist, the United States 
did not exercise the kind of restraint against the Soviet Union that it could have exercised, that would have been an ideal time to get some kind of movement toward World Federation. But instead, the United States took it as, oh, we have won over the Soviet Union. We'll tell them what to do now. The final decade of the 20th century is such a time of missed opportunity. Can you speak? I'm having trouble hearing you. I bet others are too. Yes, it uh, flashed across my screen that we have a weak connection. Anybody hear me? Yes. Now we can. Oh, the final decade of the 20th century was probably the greatest uh, period of missed opportunity in our lives and maybe forever. We had, every, we had everything from the end of the Soviet Union and, and the possibility of, of forging peace between North America and Northern Eurasia to uh, dropping the ball on climate change to completely uh, failing to use the, the fantastic one-time only symbolism of a change of millennia to, uh, to set goals for a completely new and, and better age. And, and how did we inaugurate the first day of 2000? Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin was appointed head of uh, resurgent Russia. Oh, and, and Y2K, and, and uh, nothing but missed opportunities during that period. And it, 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 it made me sad then, and it makes me sad now. However, I'll just quickly append this idea. At the end of this year is kind of like a reprise of the end of, uh, of, of the turn of the millennium. As we go into 2020, at least numerically, it kind of looks like going into 2000. I think we should find a way to uh, pump up for the last time some of that turn of the millennium symbolism uh, as we enter uh, the 2020s. Uh, it, uh, the first day of the new decade would be a great time for some kind of proclamation uh, going into that time. I'm not saying wait until then. Uh, it's, a, it's a job of preparation from now until the final day of this year, which is also the last day of the decade. And it's the day before we enter this, it's not a millennium, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a, another block of time. And maybe there's some symbolism we can get a hold of there as we also replay the big turning of 20 years earlier. Great point. Yeah. Thank you. Donna Stack. Donna? Gail, I just want to say something about, I mean, clearly, this is not the same world as it was when the U.S. transformed itself from a confederation to a federation. And I, I think one of the challenges is, and it it's maybe answers Gregory's point about, I think what's wrong is there are wealth, powerful pe people who make money off of the war system. And many of the non-powerful people in America think, or in the U.S., sorry, Ron, in the U.S., um, think that, that the, the military system is what keeps us safe and secure. And that the whole thing that got me so excited about planethood and one world democracy and the idea of world federation is that there is another way. When Father Ben used to say he wanted to end the war system, I thought he was smoking something that I really wanted. And then I read these books and I realized there is another way. So I think what we have to do is get the message out to the common person in, in the United States that we know another way that the military is not what keeps us safe and secure anymore the way it did back in D-Day. And, you know, we need to honor those people and thank them. But but the biggest problems facing us, I mean, our, our strong military is not going to be what keeps us safe and secure. We need, you know, we need, first of all, we need the money that we pour into the military in order to solve the other bigger problems facing humanity, both in our nation and outside the nation. And we need structures so that we can disband, we can't, as, as Ben points out in this book, we can't disband the military until we have another solution. So first we need to get the United States working better, transformed, and then we can start moving money from the military to other things. And I, I think, you know, I, I don't know. That's what I think. Thank you. Good points. Thank you. Donna, how does that connect with, um, with Bob's roadmap, do you think? 
totally. I mean, what Bob's roadmap is saying is that we need to transform the UN. You know, he, he's saying that art, you know, his roadmap is, well, and it's not Bob's, it's CTS's roadmap, that our goal is a peaceful, free, ju just, and sustainable world community, and that we think the way to get there is through a transformed, U transforming the UN into a world federation with a constitution and a bill of rights. And, and that, so that, how do we get there? So, um, so, I mean, it's totally consistent with the roadmap. Other comments Larry. about that? Ben? Oh. Larry. Larry. Larry, no, you're on. I, I, um, I want to say that for me, the, the most cogent piece of, of information that you can transmit in a sentence about World Federation and but about the distinction between strong federal unions and weak unions, whether they're called federal or whether they're called unions or or uh, uh, or, or if they're called federations, it, the real distinguishing characteristic is that a strong federal union has a monopoly on power, a monopoly on force in the United States. The federal government controls all of the military. The, yes, the states have national guards, but no governor of any state has access to nuclear weapons or to any um, uh, or, or to big naval ships or uh, large armies. And, and uh, in the European Union, which some people refer to as a federation. It is a very weak confederation. The states that form the European Union have their own armies. They have their own militaries. And the European Union does not have a monopoly on force. If it did, it would be a strong union. And it's easy enough to point out then the distinction between what the US is as a federation, a very strong federation versus a weak uh, confederation or what some people call a union. Anyway, talking about monopoly on power is a great way to, to make the distinction in a couple of words. Well, this, this gets to um, what uh, ben was talking about regarding we need a delicate balance here on the one hand if a federation is too weak then it doesn't work but if it's too strong then also it doesn't work because it becomes oppressive and that's the part that i found most challenging i mean that will be the biggest challenge is to get that right balance and not only that it has to be maintained so in the U.S., for example, we got that balance, and I, I think that balance has gotten out of whack. I mean, I think the checks and balances have been undermined, and that's a lot of the problems we have right now. So it isn't just a matter of getting, you know, creating a system that has that right balance, but also maintaining it. And I find Very that stacked. idea daunting. Mm -hmm. yeah, one more time. You know, so the... So the uh, idea of the founders was to figure out how to have government without tyranny. And, and the way to do that was to keep a king from rising to power. And the way to do that was by splitting the power up between three branches of government and then putting term limits on, on the uh, president. And um, uh, What's happened, you put your finger on it, what's happened in the United States, the fundamental thing that has gone wrong is that the military industrial complex has taken over the United States of America. And it is in control of the power, it's in control of the money, and it's, control of, it's in control essentially of the rest of the world. It, 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 dominates, it dominates the rest of the world and is able to invade countries, destroy uh, other countries with impunity without being without being attacked in return 
So um, the United States is off the rails because of the because of the uh, um, supremacy that uh, of, of force after World War II that has evolved into um, a runaway military industrial complex that eats up the resources, the environment, and then the sovereignty of other nations globally. I have another comment if I could. Yes, go ahead. I, as I was reading along the book on page 49 in my copy um, about limiting power, I was quite struck by one sentence. And that sentence reads, because of the wife's checks and balances that limit the power of Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch, no king or dictator can get control of the government of the United States. And I just couldn't help about, think about what has happened in the last couple of years in our country. It's, I don't have confidence that checks and balances are working very well right now because of what's happened with our president and his um, gaining more and more control of the government, it seems. Comments for other people on that? I would just observe that our president and, and his miserable political party are basically the same thing right now. You've got this very large institution called the Republican Party, and it is, under, it's, it, it is what is undermining everything. Trump has got the complete assistance of virtually every Republican in that other major branch of government. And now that he's filling up the judiciary, that's going to be part of the Republican power establishment, too. Um, I think the Republican Party has to be called out as the single most destructive large-scale political institution in the modern Western world. Ron has a comment. This is a problem, but it goes back and forth. One of the great values of democracy is it is a good system in the long run, even though there are variations going back and forth in the meantime. The kinds of problems we have in this country right now, we have had in the past. And usually when there's a movement in one direction too far, then there's reaction against it and it takes us back to the middle again. 2020 will tell the tale. Yeah. I'm thinking uh, of, the, of the phrase, the, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And um, I think that needs to be examined as to what do we need to do once, you know, once a federation is created that does have that right balance, what are the threats to that balance and what can be built in to make, make it stronger to, um, to prevent undermining the balance or ways to um, address it if it gets out of whack? Because uh, there's some things in the U.S. system that, well, um, Donna mentioned that now it, the military industrial complex has a vested interest financially that the original states, the, there were power, states more powerful than others, but they didn't abuse that power. Well, why not? Well, maybe because there weren't those vested interests then. I don't know. But we need to, I mean, that's part of, I think, what we need to do in terms of um, really looking into that to implement, um, to institute um, kind of uh, protections yeah. against undermining of that balance. Tom H. Deck. Tom? Uh, I think one of the difficulties we're seeing is, uh, well, I agree with Ron that we go back and forth, but we seem to be going back and forth to more extremes and it's getting worse and worse and um, somehow figure out how to <coughs> avoid going from one extreme to the other in the United States. Um, some, some way for picking judges that doesn't depend on who just won the election and things like that. It, it, uh, oh, I think we, but I don't want to get too, too deep there, but I just think that there are some serious problems that the United States is running into 
And so it's going to be hard, coming harder and harder for us to use the United States as a good example. So, uh, yep. This is Ron. I, I agree to a large extent, but the problem is that we don't have the global government to restrain the United States. It, this, and we don't have it to restrain China. And we don't have it to restrain Russia. So it's just another way of arguing that we do need to have some kind of global government in order to restrain not only our own national government, but also the other national governments. That's maybe, and maybe we should be bringing that up when we try to sell the idea of World Federation. I think that would <clears throat> uh, make it much more appealing uh, for people to support World Federation. Thank you. Well, are we ready to move on to the last question of Step six and seven, tell your friends and neighbors and do your daily deed for peace. I think most of us are doing our daily deed plus more. But in terms of telling our friends and neighbors, I notice a bunch of um, World Federalist related organizations listed on page 155 in the original book. And I think some of them no longer exist, but I, of those that do exist, um, you know, can we maybe see if we can contact them and coordinate with them at all, or what, are, what about these organizations? Hmm. We know what happened way. to the campaign for UN reform. Right, and the Center for War and Peace Studies is a very small organization um, that was established with a, 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 the binding triad. Um, and we are in communication with them. Parliamentarians for Global Action, I never heard of them. Sorry, um, oh, Donna. Maya has a comment after Donna, maybe. I think, Donna, you wanted to say something, Bill? You can go first, Maya. No, just in terms of, of, of groups and, and to reach out to for UN 2020, this 2020 date that maybe can be made something of there's a UN 2020 campaign. Do some of you already know about it? Yes. Yes, yes of course. Endorsed yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And but also there's the Together First movement, which is 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 working with you in 2020. Um, and so you can go to the Together First uh, website and sign up to. Uh, there will be like a principles and values sign up statement for civil society groups and, and citizens who are calling for strength and global governance, uh, which would obviously include so many of these different, uh, you know, classical ideas to strengthen our world federal system. But the Together First website is www.togetherfirst.org. Um, but uh, yeah, the meeting that I was just at in Washington, DC, was trying to network with uh, a range of different groups uh, around the world and also in the US, UN associations and trying to really build a lot of public dialogue uh, with, with citizens. And what you've been talking about, about reaching out to fellow Americans is really amazing. It sounds so promising and, and really inspiring. Um, and I think the analogies with US uh, Federation are, are, are extremely helpful for Americans in particular, but also globally. In terms of talking with friends and neighbors on C-SPAN, just yesterday, there was a presentation by a young behavioral scientist who has started an organization called VoteTripling.org. Uh, this, this analyst points out that, um, that people talking with their friends and neighbors, people who know and respect one another, is far more effective in in moving votes towards certain candidates than uh, all of the traditional door knocking and phone banking and, and, all, and all the rest of that. And uh, he's got a, um, a campaign going called Pledge to uh, Talk to Three or, or something like that, Talk to Three. If each person who wants to see a, something happen talks, persuades just three people to vote, that, that, that's his point. That's, if enough of that happens, that's far more effective than all of the other 
more traditional ways of uh, persuading uh, other people politically uh, to uh, go with somebody's uh, point of view. Maybe that can be applied to this movement. Um, and in conjunction with that, I think it's time for uh, the world federalists and, uh, and, and, and our uh, colleagues to, to come up with a, a very short uh, set of questions, two or three questions that would be presented to all of the uh, two dozen Democratic presidential candidates and to the one Republican challenging uh, Trump, William Weld, uh, asking if they support, uh, for example, United Nations reform. And, and just and get and get this into the campaign, which is not not even talked about nuclear proliferation or united or or global unity or 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 a UN reform or any of that. This is the time to get that out <clears throat> into this big campaign for 2020 in the United States. That is a great suggestion, Gregory. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Ted Daly. Ted. Yeah, I boy, I uh, th this is a very uh, this is very useful. I uh, hello Maya. I'm not sure we've met, but I I, I, I gather that you were at this Simpson meeting this past week in uh, Washington D.C. Yes. And I, I, I really uh, I really liked the last two comments, both from Gregory Wright and from uh, Maya. Um, yes, Maya, we are very aware of the UN 2020 campaign. And, and then uh, and then Greg brought up the, the notion of the U.S. presidential election. And I, I just want to – forgive me, I'm thinking out loud here. We need to crack that nut. Um, Gregory is absolutely correct that – I follow the, 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 the 2020 Democratic presidential campaign very closely, and I have not heard a peep about global governance from any candidate, a peep about the United Nations. Uh, I, I know that we in the UN 2020 community are talking very much about that 75th anniversary. And if you don't know it, folks, the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations is 10 days before the November election. Yeah. 10 days. That's how close they are. October 24th and November 3rd, I believe it is. Wow. So right. I don't know exactly how to solve this, but we have to find a way to get the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and a vision of the future United Nations to somehow be part of the foreign policy conversation in the 2020 uh, U.S. presidential campaign. Let's really keep brainstorming about that. Otherwise, my fear, and this is a bit of a downer, but my fear is it's going to be a one-day news story for the wider public. You know, they'll, they'll hear on the NPR News that morning, October 24th today is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, and that's all they'll hear about it. Now here's I think we can really find some way to leverage this, to, to make it, uh, to, to generate some conversation about not just the anniversary, but as the Together First people and the UN 2020 people have been saying, to well, make it about a future vision as well. Can Thank I, you. Here's a, here's a way to do it. Uh, our whole movement should uh, come together, design, and then publish in the next several months, a, a 2020 calendar. There are so many anniversaries in, in the year 2020. We've just heard about two of the big ones, October 24th and the election on November 3rd. Uh, a calendar that just makes this a year long story going into that uh, all important November 2020 election uh, and, and recounting all of the many uh, milestones and anniversaries that will occur next year. And, and in it, the, the efforts and identification of the various organizations like the UN 2020 campaign and Together First campaign uh, and, and their events. It, would, it, would be, it could be chock-a-block with this stuff uh, as we move through the first year of the next decade. But we'd have to publish it this year and design it in the next few months. I like that a lot, not, not, to, not, not to dominate here with, with just this point, but if I may... There's at least two other huge ones that I just want to remind us all of. One is the dawn of the atomic age. The 75th anniversary of the dawn of the atomic age will be July 16th. That's when the, uh, the detonation happened in the desert in New Mexico. And then, of course, August 6th and August 9th are Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
But let me also remind us all that fortunately we have two United Nations anniversaries that we can uh, use to mobilize some attention. I think most people know this, but let me just explicitly uh, say it. There are two UN days. June 26th is the day the charter was signed by President Truman and other world leaders in San Francisco. So that will be the 75th anniversary next year, June 26th. And then, of course, as I said earlier, October 24th is the day the charter actually came into force. Uh, when the, the the correct number of ratifications had taken place had taken place, so let's do everything we can to mobilize all of those. Donna Stack. Not Tommy. Donna. Um, so if I reach out to my neighbors and friends, and, and which I do, and say, you know, I, I want to transform the UN, what what can I ask them to do? to like like what do we do do we you know we tell our elected representatives we want a stronger un it doesn't really we tell president trump we want us who do we tell what do we do uh, uh, maybe um maybe tad or or uh, maya can help me here like so who do we what do we do to show our support hmm. okay. So, sorry, okay, so con concrete actions. Tad had a great suggestion about uh, putting together the calendar of events that then you can feed into and, and, and try to link up in terms of materials and agenda setting for the, the, the 2020 UN Leaders Summit. Uh, and there will be a resolution outcome document from the General Assembly for the 75th anniversary. anniversary. So there will be a lot of uh, NGO uh, uh, feeding into that and lobbying um, and maybe producing an alternative resolution. So I would say get in touch with Fergus um, and Jeff uh, at UN 2020 and others to find out the, the, the calendar as it's coming together, for example, in terms of the international civil society engagement. And, and, and even if, you, if, if, if one can't go to all the different meetings and events, you can still get the materials and, and, and track, and that can be a basis for, for more local or regional events and discussions and dialogues. And, and then this wonderful idea also of uh, feeding into the, the US uh, election. The, the only candidate that I've really heard recently talk about maybe foreign policy-ish peace-related issues is Mary, Marianne Williamson talking about the uh, Department of Peace, kind of resuscitating that idea. I think Dennis Kucinich was advocating it previously. Um, so that's one candidate to the Department of Peace idea. Um, but I think that's a, it's a brilliant idea to, to, to make it part of the national agenda if, if possible. Um, but I think the idea of a calendar linking up with UN 2020 and other groups, I know the UN associations in DC and, and, and elsewhere in the US are, are trying to be very, very active. Together first, we'll have a calendar and updates. Uh, so yeah, I think the calendar idea is great. But, but people want to know what can I do? You know, like who can I talk to? Like who can I, can I call people, at least the people I deal with are used to calling their representatives or writing a letter or, or calling, writing a letter to the White House, I don't know. Like who can people write to about the UN? Who? Yeah, well, if, if I mean, if you want a, an American-based campaign, you would know best who, who to write to. Who would, I mean, because out of you, we were discussing in, in DC a uh, letter to heads, we're going to send, or there's going to be sent a letter to heads of state of the world, every country in the world saying, we want to strengthen the UN uh, for the, the 75th anniversary. Uh, so that's at the international level. So the head of state of the US will receive a letter and maybe the uh, 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 Secretary of State, other officials, but I think you in the US are best placed to think about who you want to contact with this information, with ideas from these, these global civil society and national civil society campaigns. Tom H. Jack. Tom? I'd like to integrate a couple of the suggestions here. Um, why don't we try this uh, talk to three people? And as, and as I understand it, they are then supposed to turn around and talk to three more people and so on. It's a pyramid kind of thing. And something that could be very uh, term 
would be to ask Democratic candidates what they think of the UN, whose 20, 75th anniversary will be uh, days before the election, and do that between now and the and the first debates uh, in June, and see whether we see whether we can actually get a question asking the candidates about uh, the UN. Uh, uh, try this as an experiment. See if it really works. A pyramid scheme where we each and we have to tell people that the idea is that you have to turn around and call three people to your door. <clears throat> Should we try to do that? <laughs> I don't know. And if, if people express interest, we can uh, steer them to the PDF book, A Planet Hood, uh, so they could read that. Sure. That would, that would, or, or, the PDF, or the PDF of the book, yeah. I have a question. Um, Go ahead. Um, so the idea, though, is to get the candidates, sorry. the candidates, to answer what do they think about the UN and strengthening the UN. You know, that's the, it, it, suddenly they, some of the Democratic candidates begin to advocate that, that would be a heck of a way to get the idea out in the, in public. Yes. yes. I, I just, excuse me, I just found out that the first Democratic presidential debates are going to be June 26th and June 27th. And you are right, Tom Hastings, having a question asked by one of the journalists, the questioners, about the present and future of the United Nations and maybe about the Leaders' Summit uh, would be terrific. Uh, how do we make that happen? How, I don't know. But it, 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 it's a terrific goal to get a single question posed in the June 26th debate about the future of the United Nations and global governance. Well, every, every candidate has a website, maybe a, a unified, uh, uh, short, succinct, uh, clear set of several questions could be put together and then and then that is sent uh, to each of the 23 candidates via their websites and and maybe via their, mm -hmm. each, each each candidate has a uh, an organization uh, like a private consulting organization or digital communications organization behind them uh, the question could also be posed to their uh, main consultant or consultants for example, I, I I I know how to contact the uh, the uh, Jay uh, Inslee campaign. I've been paying attention to that because he's made climate change the center of his uh, campaign. He's the governor of Washington State, my native state, so that helps too for me. And uh, and, and and pose these questions, a, a short set of questions, or maybe even a single question to each campaign, and make it clear when doing that that all of the candidates. Are, be, are, are receiving the same query from us. Okay, Jean had a question. Yeah, um, I, as we're talking, I keep thinking of something I heard some years back about the United Nations and water rights and, and water. And I seem to recall that um, big water companies were very invested in being uh, involved in the United Nations. So I'm wondering, now you've been talking about um, um, the military industrial complex. How do we deal with that in the UN? I, I'm sure you've talked about this and I probably wasn't um, in on the conversation on the days you've done this, but it seems like a really big problem. How do we keep the military industrial complex from controlling through the UN? But that is that goes back to the balance issue, doesn't it? That the UN is presently out of balance in that uh, the big powers control it. It's not um, in balance of being, um, well, <laughs> protecting the, the the smaller countries. I agree with what Larry David said that right now the military industrial complex is controlling everything. And so I think it's important that we recognize any change we can make is going to make it better. 
I really, I mean, the, the, the control is totally out of whack now. So, um, I mean, I know it seems frightening, but anything we do is going to be better than when we got now. Can I just make a very short comment on the military industrial aspect and your brilliant earlier little conversation about the military dimension and transitioning to like a true international peace system where one state would never think of the other state. I, I have a, a contact. He's a, he's a Canadian German journalist who started to work on proposals for repurposing the military to implement the SDGs and to fight climate change because we will need an, uh, a ramped up emergency response to manage climate change. Um, and he's, he's um, started on this project in, in Europe. He's already talked to a few uh, highly placed uh, people in the German military. And there's, so there's already interest gathering. So anyways, I can just share that document with the work he's, he's initiated because What's it's very his name? interesting. His name is Jasper Zimmerman. He, he was working. The first name, Jasper. Jasper, Zimmerman? yeah, Jasper Zimmerman, and he has he has a piece uh, on Medium.com about this idea of repurposing the military. And I, he just sent me like a new uh, policy brief that I haven't read yet. But I'm sure if 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 this strikes a chord or if there's interest, I'm sure he would be happy to uh, share the full proposal and discuss it with this group or other groups. Yeah. But I think it's a wonderful, like, to also to get, like, a, it would start like 5 or 10% of militaries and get them collaborating. Uh, so we build trust and, and repurposing gradually this, this sort of wise transition to a different model and different way of being. That is brilliant. I'm very yeah. interested. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just, yeah, tell me who I should email it to. I'll, I'll ask Jasper first and I can, I can share it with the group. Okay. Tom H. Stack. By the way, any any uh, any of you who are on the mailing list for the book club can at the bottom of any of the messages is a way to you can send an email to everybody in the group. So if you want to publish uh, s something to the whole group, you just look at the link at the bottom of the message, and uh, you can then uh, send a message uh, to the whole group. So, I should mention that we're out of time. Yes. Uh, do we want to continue this, um, say, a month from now, or do we want to switch to another book? Or um, we have a lot of ideas for follow-up. Um, how should we proceed with that? I think we should continue this discussion. Maybe we could have some time to do a little homework and regroup in a month. And then also we could spend half some of that meeting figuring out what we're going to do next since we didn't have we ran out of time today to figure out what we're doing next. Right. I think mm -hmm. we had a pretty a very good discussion very good. about the book. But um, not, you know, we didn't finish our follow up ideas. Uh, this, so, this is Arthur Kanagas. Uh, actually, I switched to my phone because I had to get the dogs out. Can I jump in with a suggestion? Sure. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I, 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 a great book for the book club would be Gary Davis's book, "My Country Is the World." Uh, it's a phenomenal, very easy read, very enjoyable, entertaining, and very eye-opening story. Uh, what would we think about you doing the book, "My Country Is the World," for a book club meeting? Well, why don't I um, send that idea to the listserv? There's some people who are interested in being in the group or who are in the group, but couldn't be there, couldn't be here today. We can think about it and think about other possibilities as well. And maybe okay, yeah, you know, develop an agenda of several books that'll take us through you know, the rest of the year. Okay, I think that's a great idea, and I can forward you uh, an email about it as well. I found it such a uh, such an entertaining, fun, audacious, just amazing story. I mean, you see, all it was captured in the movie, but there's even so much more than in the movie in the book. So uh, I think that would be a lot of fun for our readers, and very much fits the, the theme. My country is the world by Gary Davis. So okay, I'll 
I'll send you an email, and I think it's a good idea to put it out to the listserv. And the second Saturday of July is July 13. Is that going to be um, a date that will be a good one for you guys? Okay, for meet me. Then? Sounds good. Works for me. Okay. Okay, let's plan on that. And thank you, everybody, so much for your really insightful comments and a lively discussion. Thank you very much, Gail, for organizing it and getting us through it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, yeah, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Gail, and everyone. It was very good. Bye. 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 Not at all around. <laughs>